ways evolutionary psychology as it applies to combat. And a couple of caveats before we go on. Evolutionary psychology is a relatively new field. It's only about 20, 25 years old, something like that. And one of the reasons behind that is a pretty powerful reason is that when they tried to start putting an evolutionary approach to uh, social sciences back in the early 20th century, there were some terrible results because of misunderstandings about Darwin's theory and etc. And so that led to social Darwinism and even Nazism and eugenics and all that kind of stuff. That was people like trying to apply the, the evolutionary approach to human beings. So the social sciences divorced themselves from evolutionary thought for the next 80 or so years. What's happened since then is that evolutionary theory has advanced quite a bit. And it's advanced so much that the, the predictive power that it has over what humans, how humans are and how they're going to behave has become such that they can't really ignore it anymore. And so in the last 25 years or so, it's been uh, growing wildly, is the best way to put it. And so today, evolutionary psychology is challenging the rest of what we would call, in this uh, forum, legacy psychology. In other words, it's a unifying, it's a unifying theory in the same way that it is in the rest of biology or psychology now, but imagine how long it took for the people before uh, Darwin and along the, the biologists that came along before that to accept it in biology. Well, it's the same sort of fight going on now. So just kind of understand that as we go forward. Okay. Um, with that being said, people of character first seek the truth. So. Uh, I apologize if anything that I'm going to put out is offensive to anybody. Hopefully, I'm speaking to the truth. And, in, in, and certainly, everything I'm going to present to you with humility. Uh, evolution psychology is quite well developed, except for not in the area of combat. In fact, I'm pretty much the only person taking this approach to it. So, uh, it, it, some of this stuff might be wrong. Just take it as a, any presentation. We're going to cover today first the paradigm shift in psychology. That's what I was alluding to a second ago. Then, theory of combat, a, a taxonomy of combat experiences, if you will, based upon biology. And then lastly, complications that have arrived for humans because of the advent of civilization. So first, paradigm shifts in psychology. So I'd like to imagine, for example, what biologists or people who studied plants and animals did before Darwin came along. Well, they didn't have any unified theory to, to connect. But what they did was they observed things. Right? So they can say, look at this leaf, it's like this, it has these kind of veins, or look at this animal, it behaves like this, etc. So when Darwin came up with his theories, he didn't get rid of all that those people had done before. What he did was he used what they had done before and then added a unifying theory. And the reason I'm saying that is because that's actually what evolutionary psychology is doing. That's the same relationship to the legacy psychology world. It's not that any of that stuff was wrong. It's just that it lacks a unifying theory. That's the whole idea of the whole social sciences in general, lack a unifying theory. So that unifying theory can be added is Darwinism because we're biological. Our brains are evolved mechanisms, and therefore all the things that we do are evolved for, or have been under the forces of nature back up you know, the billions of years of evolution. So Darwin described the, those people as great um, observers. And so we're going to take that same approach to what all the psychologists prior have, have uh, noted. They've done a lot of great science without a unifying theory over the last many years. And so now what we have to do is sort of expand that Darwinian revolution into the realm of humanity. So now we're going to talk about legacy psychology for a second. We'll start off with World War I because that's really when it, you know, when it uh, starts to matter from, from our perspective. And almost everybody here is going to be somewhat familiar with all this. So in World War I, they thought they had a unique circumstance because of the sh massive shelling that they had. So they thought soldiers who were having psychiatric problems or suffering from shock from the sh those shells. And so that's important to note because after that war, they start, or during that war, they also started noticing a lot of people had the similar symptoms that were not subject to shelling. So even during the war, they realized that calling it shell shock wasn't an inclusive enough answer because it wasn't just that. It was the psychology of, of combat, going into combat itself, that was actually the issue. Now, what's interesting now is that 
in our, the recent wars we've had, we've had TBI as one of our major issues. And we have now know that TBI mirrors many of the effects that can happen from other psychiatric injuries. And so there was some truth in what they were saying as, uh, or what they were calling shell shock. There was, there is some uh, brain trauma can have effects that mirror some of the other things that happen in psychiatry. In World War II, there was a, they, they pretty much decided that they didn't, that the trauma from shells was, was uh, wrong, which is a mistaken conclusion. But what they focused on then, because of the nature of the war, was the extended times that people spent in combat. So their primary, their primary uh, lens they had to look at was still the Freudian lens, where they did and all that stuff, which is uh, a little bit mistaken in the way it's approached. But the, they were, had some pretty good conclusions, which was they realized that too much exposure to combat would affect people. Now we can look at that later on from our lens now and look back and say, well, those are adaptions that people make over time. Because if you're in a super high stress environment, imagine the amount of fear you have in combat. If you're in that for a, lot, a long time, your brain will start to adapt to it. And those, those adaptions may be maladaptions whenever you come back and try to integrate back into society. So they had, once again, even though they didn't have a theory of why it would all be that way that was correct, what they did have was good observations so they could say that these things happen when people are this much time in combat and stuff. The, the thing that came out of the, of the Vietnam era, what's important is the lessons they learned about how to treat psychiatric casualties and all the things about that were, were spot on. What they were wrong about, because from the Freudian idea was that there were things wrong in your childhood and whatnot that caused you to have these problems later on, to not be able to handle uh, problems later on in life. So they had a big effort to go to do screening, psychological screening of people, which they found was like they completely didn't work at all. They did it for the first couple of years, they excluded tens of thousands of people from servicing, and then whenever they, they had stopped that policy, they put a whole bunch of people in that had been screened out from service and they found out that the, those, that group of people who had been screened as unfit for combat didn't have any higher levels of psychiatric casualties than the rest of the army did. So the, the screening idea was totally wrong, or at least the way they did. Okay. What happened after Vietnam was the, the, the psychiatric community or the psychological community started noticing afterwards that returned veterans were having problems. In fact, the, the, it's an important thing to note that the, the concept of TBI started with Sky Chapin, who you can see labeled here. He wrote an article in the New York Times. It was called Post-Vietnam Syndrome. And he recognized all these symptoms, you know, victimization, rape, brutalization. Those were all things that veterans had told him. And the way they were treating them at the time was rap groups, right? They used to get together and have everybody talk together, talk out their, talk through their trauma. Which is interesting because we've now found out that that's counterproductive. Like it, it actually serves to embed the uh, memories worse in your brain. It's like imagine for a second when your earliest memories as a child. There's a pretty good chance that those memories aren't even real. And the reason they might not be real is because you've heard them so many times, other people telling the stories about when you were three or whatnot, that over time you might have just adopted those memories. It's important to know what our memories are for. Well, why do we have memories in the first place? Well, they're a guide for future action. So that doesn't necessarily mean they're true, okay? They're the same as dreams, right? Why do we have dreams? Well, our body, our brain is running simulations, just like the one to watch a movie. It's running simulations for us all the time, trying to figure out how we can behave better in the future, is the idea. Okay. So, but what the note was, they did note that there were many problems after the war, right? So that was another thing that by observing, they noticed things, even though they didn't have a, an understanding of why that would be the case. Without that either might be it. So this is just a note also on legacy psychology. Just think about it this way, right? Most of the world of psychology is made up of, cl of clinicians and psychiatrists. And both of those groups of people, they're caregivers, meaning the model is a medical model people come to them who have problems, you know? It's not much different than coming to them with any other disease, if you're coming to a doctor with a disease, and they try to fix those problems. And so therefore, the way, the, the 
way that all the different things that you can have, manifestations of combat trauma are, are laid out in all the literature, are very similar to the way you would look at or to, for a diagnosing thing, right? For diagnosing when you come here, what's wrong with this guy? What are his signs? What are his symptoms? And you can compare that to make it to make it make sense to you of what would happen if you were going out in the forest and you were trying to identify trees, right? You would go through there and you'd say, ah, oh, well, these trees have these kind of leaves. That puts them in this category. And then these leaves manifest like that, so that's this category. And then you would narrow it down to diagnose what kind of tree that was. So that's a pretty good approach if what you're trying to do is give care, right? And that's why they, they take that approach. But it's not necessarily a good approach to understanding. Because just like that approach in nature can lead you to thinking that things are related that aren't, right? So in, in evolution, there's a theory of, uh, or this, the idea of that things evolve for the environment. So imagine, for example, why do sharks and dolphins have very similar body styles? They're separated in, in evolution by you know, hundreds of millions of years, like quite some time. And yet, they manifest in a very similar body style, right? And so therefore, this kind of approach can connect things that are not necessarily connected because they manifest in similar ways. Then we got into the era of pop psychology. Note that all that other stuff before was all about treatment. So back in the 1990s, Dave Grossman, who, who taught here as an RMO, later built himself as a professor here, uh, he wrote this book, On Killing. And On Killing has a couple of First off, it's important to note that it's been a very, very influential work. His work has been very influential. His, this book was on the Commandant of the Marine Corps reading list. It was on the Chief of Staff of the Army's reading list. There was, it was uh, required reading at the FBI Academy. It was assigned in many courses here. It's quite well known around the So Grossman's idea was this. He took SLA Marshall, if you're familiar with him, he took SLA Marshall's firing data that he supposedly got from, what, from troops that came back out of the line in World War II. And he's note, and SLA Marshall noted that not very, or thought that not very many people actually fired at the enemy. Okay? So both he and Grossman attributed this to an inherent human reticence to kill other humans. Okay? And so if you think about that inherent reticence, then how about the people who do? Well, then what Grossman said about those was that group of people, those are the people who are somehow different. And he equates those in his book to the 3% of people the DSM at the time said were sociopaths. And he said that those people who are these 3% who were the sociopaths, 2% of those were the, were the bad guys, right? The wolves who were out there preying on the regular people. And he uses this exact analogy. The regular people are all sheep. The bad guys out there preying on them are the wolves. And then the 1% who are these sociopaths who were somehow empathetic, um, they were the people who were protecting the sheep from the wolves. And that's where you've, you've probably all heard the sheepdog analogy. This is where it comes from. It comes from Dave Grossman's book on killing. And that's the idea behind it, right? Now, there's a couple of problems with that. And we'll talk more about what's wrong with it, like scientifically wrong with it. But it's also of note that what it does is separates those people who are the protectors, tells them somehow they're different from the sheep. And you can even hear, like, the conscious. You know, uh, talking down to the people who were the supposed sheep. So this sold like wildfire to all the people who thought of themselves as the sheepdogs. It became really popular. Not necessarily because it was scientifically correct, but because the idea that we are better than those mere people that we are protecting is a very appealing idea to us. This is one of his follow-up books. Okay. So next thing I want to talk to you about is how aggression or, or how violence works in nature. So it's important to note that nature is both a hummingbird and Ebola, right? It's both wonderful and horrible. For much of our evolutionary time, there was nothing on the earth except for bacteria. And a couple of billion years ago, some of that bacteria started to attack or eat other bacteria. So we developed predator and prey bacteria. So one of the developments that happened after that was the prey bacteria started to learn to defend itself. And the first thing it started to do was when the predator bacteria was attacking the other bacteria, 
parts of it was released, right, because it wasn't all consumed at once. So those little extrusions that were coming out of the ones that were being eaten, the other ones learned to pick up the chemical signals and then move away. So that starts us on the path of evolution towards things higher than algae. Right? Imagine now our next step, a sponge. A sponge isn't really an animal. A sponge is a colony. That colony of animals, they talk to each other by extruding chemicals. There are some species, for example, that act like uh, uh, where you can touch them and they withdraw. So how they withdraw quickly like that? They don't have a brain and they're not even the same animal. They're a whole bunch of animals. But what happens is when you touch one of them, it extrudes chemicals, which the other ones pick up, and then they extrude the same chemicals. And so that chemical reaction happens as fast as we can move. And coincidentally, that's exactly how our nervous system works. Our nervous system, the cells, are not connected to each other, but they're close to each other, and they extrude chemicals from each other. That's what's going on with your thinking. And the point I'm trying to make here is, this is how important violence is in evolution. It's the reason we have a nervous system. Without predator-prey behavior, without violence, there's no brains that doesn't even exist. Now the next step is to understand how prey and predator behavior works. So prey behavior, prey animals or all animals react to danger on a threat imminence continuum. And what that means is when the threat is far away, they act differently than when it's close up. Okay, so it's another point to make here, I probably should have made some slide, is that, is that mammalian brains are homologous, right? So homologies are things that are look that are come from the same root. So imagine, for example, our hand or a bat's wing or a whale's flipper. They all have basically the same bones in them. So they're homologous. Right? So our brains are much the same. Our brains are homologous with all mammals. And so we have very common things going on, just like that quote at the very beginning of our thing. So we deal with threats on a threat imminence continuum. So when the threat is far away, so imagine we're out in the field, we're a bunch of gazelles or water buffaloes or something, and we smell a lion in the brush. Well, all, all of the brain activity will be in our prefrontal cortex, or intel intelligently, we will be trying to outsmart the predator. So perhaps we'll move out into the grass, we'll make a tactical decision, move out into the short grass where it's very hard for them to ambush us or something like that. Okay. Now that activity is quite different than what happens in a circus strike. Circus strike just means a near strike, so it's uh, like an ambush. Imagine that. When a circus strike goes down, the brain activity doesn't get to the prefrontal cortex. It stops short, stays in the amygdala. And in the amygdala, where that's way below where your intelligence is. And so where you react instinctively at that point. And so that same thing happens to the gazelles that we call panic. What's of note there is that's a predictable pattern of brain activity for those uh, incidents. Now that could be contrasted with prey be, uh, with a predator behavior. Imagine when a, a lion is going out on the hunt. They're hungry. They're just going to the refrigerator. So the brain activity stays in their prefrontal cortex as they're plotting their attack. Even after they initiate that attack. During that time, they're thinking through it. They're not panicking. They're going, well, you know, even if it goes bad, they're like, oh, this isn't working out for me, and so they might just disengage. But the entire time, the experience is completely different than it is for the prey. Now that's of note because you can compare what happens to soldiers the same way. If we're driving down the road in a truck and we get a circus drive, which is the ambush, the brain activity that happens to us is the exact same that happens to the cells. Our, our brain activity leaves our prefrontal cortex, goes, stays in the amygdala, and we have that sort of experience. When we're on a raid or an ambush or something like that, we're the attacker, we're the predator, we're having all of our, as long as it's going our way, all of our brain activity is gonna be in the prefrontal cortex. We're that lion on the hunt. Now these two things can be uh, separated from what goes in hierarchical fighting, okay? 
So social animals arrange themselves into hierarchies for the purposes of mate selection. They all do it kind of differently, but there are patterns that hold true across all of them, or okay, across lots of them. So for example, even among crustaceans, right? You could take two lobsters who've never seen each another lobster in their life. You could put them into a tank together, and two male lobsters will go through the ritual of fighting. The first thing they'll do is posture to each other. And if one of them is a lot bigger than the other one, the smaller one will scurry away, and they have now established a hierarchy. Okay? If they're about the same size, they'll wrestle. They grab each other by the claw, and they try to flip each other over. If one of them can flip the other one over, they'll scurry away and establish a hierarchy. If neither one of them can flip each other over, then they come back and fight in earnest. This time they're trying to snip each other's eyes off and really hurt each other. And the reason why this ritual evolved is because, imagine, those two lobsters are fighting it out. Lobster C is just waiting for them to hurt each other. So it's a better idea if they have, if they have mechanisms that make them not fight all the way to the death. Everybody kind of get the idea? What's also of note here is that behavior comes before cognition. Think about that for a second, right? Crickets don't have brains. Lobster's brains are like a small little nervous system tube, and yet they have complex behavior patterns. So even in humans, most of our behavior patterns do not involve our intelligence. We can talk about that more later, but get the idea. Behavior before cognition. And you can see that that exact same mechanism that we have, that hierarchical fighting, that's the two tough guys in the bar. That's the UFC. That's all those sort of things where hierarchical fighting. It's not real fighting. They're just trying to get a better social position. That's the point. Okay. Interestingly enough, the reason lobsters fight is because they're fighting over caves, right? The females molt when they have babies, and so therefore they need protection. So the males take themselves out of big caves, and so the females want the male in the biggest cave, and that's why they fight. Not too different than you. So, with well, that being said, all social species have that going on. Some social species have evolved another mechanism, which is male coalition reproductive strategy. And there's a, a bunch of subtleties in here, but I'm going I'm to highlight three species that use male coalition reproductive strategies. Wolves, chimpanzees, and humans. This is the way we do it. Okay? So what's important here is that within their in-group, that's their pack, their, whatever their in-group happens to be, we have hierarchical fighting going on. So the wolves within the pack are trying to figure out who the top is. They also add coalition building, so leadership. The alpha of the wolf pack or the alpha of the chimpanzees or the alpha of the human, they don't become the top person or the top wolf by being the biggest toughest. Because one, however big and tough they could be, it can be taken out by three. So really, it's about building a coalition. The one that can build the coalition of people, that's the powerful one. And they do it in the exact same way that our politicians and whatnot do. They gather a bunch of followers, they take care of their followers. Now, the, what goes on between those groups is war. It's the same for chimpanzees, it's the same for human beings, it's the same for wolves. And I'll give you some examples here in a second. But what they're fighting over is resources. So imagine a pack of wolves has a territory that they like to hunt in. And they will keep all the other packs out of that territory. So they patrol their perimeter. And if there's other... Uh, areas that they would like to have, they will conduct raids and they will conduct ambushes and all that, all those sort of guerrilla warfare type tactics. Those are all the things that they do. In fact, it gets more sophisticated than that. I'll, I'll talk more about that in a second. But it's also of note that those behavior patterns, raids, ambushes, those male coalition uh, war, they are the same across all, are very similar across those species. And I'm not sure if I have a slide to cover it. But among humans, among human hunter-gatherers, uh, the rates of conspecific death are almost the same as they are among chimpanzees and wolves. In other words, interspecies warfare amounts to the majority of deaths 
among human hunter-gatherers, wolves, and, ch and chimpanzees. That's the normal way that all those species die. Uh, of note on here, I should have come already, victory or defeat in the wars between them it can be predicted by the, the makeup of the coalitions. So for example, four wolves will lose to five wolves on a predictable basis. And the, so the variables are size of the coalition, primarily the number of males, but females also take part in some species, and then the age of the male. So among wolves, leadership is actually, besides mass, leadership is the number, is the number two variable. So, As winter retreats from Lamar, a new threat to the Druids invades the valley. A strong pack of 15 from Slough Creek to the north. They're already deep in Druid territory, intent on conquest. The Druids respond, but their strength has diminished. Now, they are only nine. The Slews can hear the Druids' weakness and attack. Though outnumbered, the Druids set out to meet them. Tails waving high with confidence, the Slews smell victory. Druids are fighting for everything they own. The battle begins in confusion. The young Druids don't know what to do. Then the chief of the Slews takes charge, attacking the Druids' new leader. The druids are on the run. The best they can do is escape with their lives. mighty druid clan is scattered. Bound for hard times, they head into exile. The slews begin to gather. They have done what no other pack has been able to do in almost ten years. They've broken the Druids and taken Lamar, the greatest prize in Yellowstone. And they know it. Their victory celebration is loud and long. Just them take, you know, having a battle, 
taking the territory, not too different than all the battles in human history. With that being said, the next thing that happened was victors of that. They took over the new territory. They got themselves a headquarters, which was basically a small hill that they could burrow in for their, uh, to have their uh, pups and whatnot. And then the way they were operating was they had the females taking turns, taking care of the pups while some of the other females and then all the males were out hunting and whatnot. Well, not too long after they took this over, another larger group came in from the north of that area when they were out hunting and surrounded their hill where all their pups were. And they were too big for that group to, to attack, so no real battle went down. But that group was big enough where they could spell each other and, take, and go and get food and water and whatnot. And they laid siege to where that headquarters was until all the pups died. Left, and then the next year, since this pack didn't have any pups from the previous year, they were smaller, and so that group came back in and took them out. And them so I think probably the fact that wolves conduct siege warfare might be the most fascinating thing I've ever learned in my life. But it also says a lot towards the fact that what we do as human beings in conflict is an evolved. So what we're going to talk about now is, so we counter to what Grossman said, humans don't have an inherent reticence to kill other humans. What humans have is an evolved nature for coalition warfare where we try to win, and we try to fight only when we know we're not going to take casualties. So imagine among the way it works among the wolf pack, or the way it works whenever the Sioux were fighting the Arapaho or whatever similar patterns and similar styles of leadership. And also of note that the coalitions were small enough where everybody is involved in conflict. Everybody. So, with that being said, coalition size among these kind of species is optimized for war, not for food acquisition. So, for example, among wolves, the optimum number of wolves for a pack for hunting is four. So that means if they have five wolves, they'll all get less to eat because it's not optimal. If they have six, they'll get less to eat still, so seven and eight. As the more wolves they add, the less each individual wolf gets to eat. But if a group of four wolves is, comes across a group of five, the five will win on a predictable basis. So that means that the wolf coalitions, if another wolf from outside of their family wants to join, they'll sometimes allow them to join because they'll be stronger and they have that fifth wolf. Okay. So the coalitions grow, even though they're getting less and less to eat, they grow because they need to to be able to dominate the territory so that they can hunt. Okay. And when they get above the level where they can sustain themselves for food, then they break apart and the two groups fight each other. So that's the way it works. Now that's important to note because it was that way for human beings before civilization. So our groups were larger than that. In fact, among primates, there's a, co there's a correlation between brain size and, and social group size. And human beings' brains are another piece of evidence and predict that we would have 150 person around about social networks. So we fought that way before farming. But now imagine how farming affected that maximized for war, but, min but limited by nutrition dynamic we were just talking about. It basically gets rid of it. So instead of having a maximum size of 150, because that's all you can sustain with the terrain, your coalition can grow to 1,500, 15,000, 330 million. Okay, so that's what you farming did. So what that did was it changed the dynamic within the culture, within the group. Okay? So if you have a 150 person group, every person is involved in, in war. All of the competitions that are going on over terrain, they involve everybody. Okay? When you have 300 million, that amount of people shrinks and shrinks and shrinks that are actually involved in those conflicts with other groups. Okay? So that's important as well. So, Let's talk for a second about, about human cognition, like what, the way we think. Okay. What makes humans different than other animals is the size of our prefrontal cortex. 
Now what that does is give us a stronger feedback loop to behave, to control some of our behaviors. Imagine the way it works for animals. Uh, your, your brain is basically a, a bifurcated tube that is folded up, okay? Bifurcated because on one side of it is where signals come in and the other side is where signals go out. The incoming side is where we get all of our stuff like feeling, hunger, etc. All the stimuli that, that uh, affect us. They go through our brain, get processed, and then it spits out behavior patterns. You know, so that's, I'm sitting at the, uh, in front of my television and uh, my stomach feels a little bit hungry and without thinking about it, I get up and go to the refrigerator. Right? That's kind of the way it works. And what our, what our prefrontal cortex does, it comes after the portions that give the, the actions. So in other words, the, the stimulus has come in and they go to places like the amygdala and the hypothalamus and those kind of things and those spit out actions that we want to take. And that goes to our prefrontal cortex, and then we consider those actions. And then we can create a feedback loop that controls somewhat those actions. Somewhat. Yeah, remember I said earlier, behavior comes before cognition. This is how it works. Your cognition comes later, and you can somewhat create a feedback loop. And we all kind of know this because of what we know about psychomotor learning. But it's interesting to note as well that character learning, all that, it comes, it works in the same way. You have all the you know, stimulus and then action, if it works out good for you, you reinforce those synaptic connections inside your brain and you build those habits. That's why, for example, people who were raised like without any temptations to do wrong, they get to be 18 and go out in the world and go wild because they never built that feedback loop so that they can control themselves. So that's not the best way to, get, to teach character. So with that being said, um, so we can think in the abstract. So what I mean by that, we can think in the abstract as in we can know that there's a future. So knowing there a future, there's a future is, gives us an advantage from the, uh, the perspective of surviving appropriately, right? We know there's a future so we can prepare for it. We will not necessarily eat all the corn we have. We'll save some of it so we can plant and have corn next year. Now, the bad news about that is that mechanism works through anxiety to where I think which is where fear comes from, right? So we have an inherent relationship between fear and the future all the time. Also, the ability to be able to think in abstract is what lets us be able to admire people. So think about the Piagetian model we've talked about before about how children learn. They first start off by imitating their parents. But then, for too long, they're not imitating. They're pulling out the abstraction. Imagine little kids who are playing house, or they're playing war, or they're playing something like that. The one who's playing, you know, mommy or daddy when they're playing house, they're not just imitating their mother or their father. They are thinking an abstraction about what it means to be a mother or father, and they are acting those things out in play because they are practicing, just like we were talking earlier about the way movies are, the way dreams are, right? It's a uh, your, your brain is running simulations even when you're that age. Right? So, so we can learn to admire people in that regard, same way we admire our parents when they're early. And what we admire are the things that make people successful. So we admire honesty because honest people are generally more, su are more successful in life than dishonest people. And it goes that way down the list of the things we admire, even to things like beauty. We admire those things because they generally make you more successful. Now, one of the ways humans are more sophisticated than wolves and, and uh, chimpanzees about how we form our in groups. So we have lots of different ways that we form our in groups. Okay? Without going into all of them, you can imagine all the things, that, all the in groups that you yourself are part of. You know? Some people identify with the way, kind of music they like. Some people identify with the country they're from. Some people identify whatever it happens to be. We as humans can select how we form our in-groups. And then we behave much the same way as those wolves and chimpanzee in-groups once we have those groups selected. Okay? And one of those ways that we form in-groups is by forming belief systems. And if you note, like on the big scale, we've had this battle going on with the radical Islam for many years, and et cetera. You can think about that as in belief systems are the reasons why we can't necessarily talk to each other because people who use the same language 
the different belief systems, they mean different things when they say the same words. So with that being said, in a human hunter-gatherer society where everybody is involved in war, the things that people will naturally admire are warlike things. Imagine if we're in a 150-person group and every single person in that group is part of the effort to sustain our group and make sure we survive and we get to raise our children and have food. That group doesn't have use for Gandhi, right? Because Gandhi's dead work. He's not taking part in the fights. And so they would admire things that are people who can pull their weight in battle, not, you know, among other people. So now, as we get this specialization that was made possible by the larger coalition from farming, Imagine we stood that 150 group, now we got 1,500, 15,000, 150,000, et cetera, and we get this decreasing amount of the population that are involved in war, these belief systems start to diverge. Okay. And you can see that over time in history as we have grown more and more passive as a sort of our ideas have grown more and more passive as a species. I use this as a pretty good example because these, this tendency even affects our belief systems. So imagine, for example, we have the same religion that went on the Crusades, and then this is the manifestation of that a thousand years later. Okay? It's the same book, it's ostensibly the same belief system, but it's entirely different actions. And the reason it's entirely different actions is because the belief system is affected by this evolution of society. Okay, so so let's talk a little bit about cultural transmission. Okay, so cultures transmit through the ages in three different ways. First, first one is vertical. That's you have children, you pass on to your children. That's the one that's most enduring. The things that you pass on to your children will be affected more what was passed on by your parents than from the other factors that we're about to talk about. But the other factors are horizontal. As we talked about how Piaget, earlier we talked about Piaget's theory on childhood development, right? They mostly learn their morals from their, child, from their peers. What that means is through games, through all those things that we, like I said last time we talked, that's where they get the norms of how they behave with each other. And that's what cultures do. They, they, enhance, they allow us to be able to behave cooperatively together. In fact, most of the things that we do as humans, they're, they're behaviors that are evolved such that make us easier to cooperate with each other. Okay? And the last one is oblique through a teachers and whatnot. So imagine when we have our students, they're learning from each other, and they're learning from us obliquely, and they also learn from their parents. So those are the vectors that pass on culture, okay? Now, imagine how that process works when we have a smaller and smaller portion of the population that is involved in the wars. Because what it means is the parents who are 40 generations deep in the, in the uh, peacetime side of those things, they're gonna have a value set that's not informed necessarily by conflict. Their peers are all going to be people mostly raised by that kind of people as well. And so therefore, the, the society will become more and more peaceful-minded over time. But that hasn't changed the reality that some people will still be the ones out there on the point. So before I go on from that, the reason we're talking about this reason why this is significant is one of the things we're finding now just recently in psychology is that much of what we call PTSD is actually moral injuries. So a moral injury is when a deeply held belief is destroyed by the realities of war. I think we talked about it before, but just imagine, for example, you raised, you raised your whole life to, to that was one of the most evil things you could do to kill a child, for example. Then you find yourself on the battlefield in Somalia and Bad guys hide behind children. And if you don't shoot them, you're gonna die. So you do. And now you've been raised in this environment where nobody in your, none of your parents, none of your peers' parents, none of your teachers, 
you know, your high school guidance counselor, your preacher, et cetera, et cetera, none of those people's morality was informed by the reality of that situation, which remains real throughout all time. Human war now isn't worse than chimpanzee war. Chimpanzees, whenever they kill each other, they tear each other limb from limb and dance in the body parts. Right? They, it's just as horrible as human as, as modern war. So those beliefs that we have, the point there is we have to examine them. I mean, most of what we do in life is uncritical copy. Think about how you learned almost everything from any coach you ever learned. How many times when you were learning baseball did anybody consider why is the pitcher's mound this far away from the plate? But there's a reason, right? And so we have to take that sort of key and fourth level approach to our morality. We have to be able to look at it and understand it and understand how it got there. Because if we don't, we're setting ourselves up for those moral issues. So <clears throat> on another thing, so that's what one of the one of the things that happens with civilization. Another is in the way we fight. So imagine how we were talking about the wolves fighting earlier and how indigenous tribes around the world fight. It's much the same way, but that's not how civilizations fight. When civilized groups of people fight, we form large armies and we, we fight, we've learned so much about how to win in those fights that we have, but we have discounted our psychology. So a lot of what goes on with our problems that we have are because we're fighting in ways that are not what we were evolved to do. Okay. So I use this kind of example, you know, because we can, we can picture, you know, coming up over the top in World War I and going on the attack. You saw what happens with the wolves. Whatever the wolves or the hunter-gatherer humans, when the attack's going south, they bolt. And they don't think nothing of it, right? It's not like they're going back and shaming each other for being cowards. That's not part of it among the wolves, right? But it is among civilized humans because we've evolved these other things. Now, with that being said, the, the point I'm trying to get at here is this. The nature of human beings, unlike what Grossman said, is we don't have a reticence to kill other humans. We have a reticence, we are, our evolved nature is to fight those kind of wars I was talking about and to fight in ways where we minimize risk to ourselves. So once again, imagine the Sioux fighting the Arapaho. They were fighting exactly that way, exactly like the wolves. That's our evolved nature. But we have some complications to that because we've created this reticence to kill other people by this evolution of our societies. Okay? And we have also created problems because we don't take into account that evolved psychology in when we're designing the ways we fight. I'll give you just an example of that for, for just for you to consider. Imagine what it was like on the side of the insurgents in Iraq. How were they fighting? Well, they were fighting exactly like those wolves, weren't they? What they were doing is they were trying to minimize the danger to themselves, and they were doing those, and they were probably hanging out with small groups of people, four, five, six of their friends, and that's who was involved in those things. And every time they were attacking, they were trying to make sure they only fought when they were gonna win, and they minimized the danger to themselves. That way of fighting meshes perfectly with our evolved nature. Our way of fighting, even though it's some ways or potentially superior, doesn't necessarily mesh it. Okay, with that being said, that's the, the wave tops of evolutionary psychology of combat. And I'll take your question. Yeah. Um, is predator cognition different among sociopaths versus highly sensitive personnel in modern warfare? Yeah, so, so what I think grossly uh, to think is sociopaths are people who don't experience empathy, right? So um, when you're talking about legacy psychology, what they're really doing is they're saying, uh, here is a behavior pattern that doesn't fit with society. And then we label those as, as uh, mental illnesses or mental problems, right? So what they really, what that language really means is that psychologists over time have noticed that some people lack empathy. And 
so that's one of the ways girls was wrong was you know it's not like the cops are in, not empathetic people or soldiers etc it's just wrong about that but if but that's <coughs> the, the, the feature that makes somebody that we would label them a sociopath or whatnot is that they don't experience any that makes them or they do that um sir my mom is british and, and my grandma is british and, and i've read this before like in world war one and world war two like everybody knew a young man that was fighting. So it was like, there was reverence, but it was a very normalized thing. Like, there was no, you know, those young men, again, there was reverence for them, but they weren't put up on a pedestal because literally ev everyone was doing it. And that's very different from the situation we find ourselves in now. Do you, you see a problem with that? So I would, I wouldn't necessarily label that as a problem, but it's a, but it's a no, that, that experience is different than our experience now and the experience with the Vietnam veterans had when they came back, right? So there's certainly interplay between the, the way you adapt uh, when you've been at war and society, and there's certainly interplay between the percentage of people who are experiencing it, I would say. So, you know, I don't know what the way we're doing it is better now, and I'm not a, so clinicians, what clinicians' expertise is, is in, is in interventions. They do is they study. Oh, here's the behavior pattern that this guy has, and here's what we can do to try to help him. Right? So I'm not an expert in that at all. But I, but what I would say is, it's of note that when you have a large coalition that is fighting another large coalition, you will have broader input from the society, and it will affect the morality of the society probably more, and especially if that's happening more often. Um, now what we have is, you know, how many of us in here grew up? In sort of warlike way at all. I certainly did. My father's an electrician and my mother's a nurse, right? That's even though my grandparents fought in the Korean War. Also of note on that though is remember I was saying earlier that the uh, the ways they handled it in the old in the Vietnam era was they tried to come back and talk it out with each other. We found out that, that was uh, counterproductive based on uh, the PTSD symptoms worse over time, right? And so it's known that this World War II generation mostly Also, while you're while we're on that, it's another like imagine the experience we're having now. Where we have people who've gone repeatedly to war over decades, and the adaptions that your brain are going to make over that time are going to be profound. You're going to end up changing. And that's one of the things they're finding out now. You know, all these all these uh, psychotropic drugs everybody was given everybody ten years ago. Well, what they're finding out now is that when you give those drugs, it changes your brain. Like it does brain doesn't just like get fixed from that, it changes like if you're, you know, you change what it's up to. you'll be 
because everybody in your life would be that. But also that now we have the problem of you know the separate warrior class from us in this particular. So I would I would think that's what's happening. Just the same way, you know, how many people whose parents were academics become academics, soldiers are the same way. And I think we're we're more and more seeing that and we're probably seeing we can probably look at societies in the past like Chinese society in the old days and whatnot and see that same sort of uh, effect happened over the centuries. So I thought it was kind of interesting when you were talking about like wolves and the chimpanzees and early humans fighting. There is always an end state to their battles, right? They either achieve more land or they oil get more food. And after the initial or after the fight, there was, you know, there was an outcome that was clearly articulated or seen. And if you look at us now, more in the modern sense, it's like we fight day after day with no physical achievement and state or knowing whether or not we're gonna have to fight again very soon. I wonder if you were to do something like that to Wolves, you can somehow replicate it, how it would affect them. Yeah. You know, it's a good question, but I think it brings up the point that you know, Wolves, when they're fighting, they're fighting for something that means something to, right. to them personally. You know? And that's the same thing with all the sorts of tribal fighting Balls warfare that we're talking about, and this is one of the things that happens in modern societies. We're a very complex society, and as we get more and more of a caste system, the, the much of the culture is pushed down from the top, and those people are but are even less and less likely to be the ones who are experiencing that combat. So just just to kind of bring it into the army, imagine for example how many of our general officers ten years ago had any experience, much less prolonged experience. In you know the platoon and, and war, well, that number is going to be larger in the future because we have all this experience. But that group of people at that time, their value system may or may not be you know, fitting for that group at the bottom. It may be imposed upon them. See what I mean? Yeah. And I think that that's it's probably a good point that if the wolves are fighting for something that affects them personally, and they get an outcome. Good or bad, we won this battle and you want to eat. We lost that battle, now we're starving. You mentioned that what we often think of as PTSD may actually be um, moral injuries, something along that line. Some of them. Some of it. Yeah. But I guess my question is with the, with the technology or type of weapon systems that we have nowadays, um, is there a difference in, in the way we should train soldiers or leaders or, or deal with them after war in, when they've experienced either killing through the clear? From I think I think that we're at the stage now of we're not at that stage yet because the first step is to know the truth, right? So if we don't know the truth, then we can't come up with with good solutions. And so I would say that potentially we can we can structure ourselves in ways better, we can fight in ways better that give us victory but also give us fewer we can train ourselves. We I mean, I would, from a personal perspective, I would say, you know, imagine our, our whittling system and we're trying to get people to level, you know, level up in the, in the Keegan's uh, idea. Well, what's level four, right? It's like examining your own belief systems. You know, if you, if you can't get to the level where you're examining your belief systems, you're gonna be just uncritically copying the belief systems that were given to you. And if those may or may not be adapted for what you're, so, and I would say that's, you know, from where we're standing, that's something that we can, it fits right in with our mission, right? What our mission is, is to you know, raise warrior leaders of excellence. And certainly among those things are people who have examined their belief systems and understand them. And I think it will, if we, if we first seek the truth, then we will have better mechanisms in the future because it will come from the position that's as I said at the very beginning, you know, that quote from Miyamoto Masashi, the great, the truth is. Right? You can either accept what the truth is, or seek the truth, or you can fight against it, live a lie. That's it, those are the choices. And so, so we don't first seek the truth, we're first trying to figure out what the way things really are. And that's why that approach that, you know, getting rid of, even though it was for very good reasons, I mean, how much better reasons could you have than Nazism and eugenicism? 
social darwinism. Those are pretty horrible things. But, but those things made us not see the truth for like, a long time. And so the answer to those things is like not, uh, the answer is not to not see the truth. The answer is to seek the truth and get better answers. slide was humans originally were not meant for long-term continuous war like going on patrols every single day for 18 months was not meant to be a part of our um, evolution but nowadays the, the shift on war is more on kind of like to what Jeff was saying more on intangible things where enemies are attacking the economy we have this whole cyber warfare going on so in some ways there are certain soldiers that have high levels of, of anxiety for very long periods of time but it's not an outright threat direct to you. You know, you're not on a patrol. Someone's not, you know, yeah. shooting at you. So, what do you think that will do to humans long term? So, I think, I think that living with anxiety is not necessarily uh, unnatural. Imagine the wolves we were talking about. They're for their whole lives, from the time they're pups until they eventually are killed by by another wolf in a fight. That's their life, right? And they know it. They don't know it because they don't have. To. They don't know the future. Yet. <clears throat> potentially, that's just one of the side effects of growing cognition is that we have more anxiety than, than other species, right? And, and potentially, but I would say that it's not necessarily unnatural from an evolutionary perspective to be at high levels of anxiety for a very long time, perhaps your whole life. Um, a, a better way to think about it is this. One of the problems that happens to people in America. In fact, uh, the name of this is escaping me. But there's, a, there's a syndrome that happens quite frequently to, to uh, women who are uh, get married when they're young and then are essentially taken care of and then they get divorced when they're like 40 or something like that. And suddenly they have to be adults when they didn't have to be all those years they were being taken care of. And so then their anxiety levels go from zero because they were being taken care of to 100% because now they have to figure out their bills and the, the world and the job and et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. And so that, that's, I can't remember the name of it, but it's quite common syndrome out of the Soviet world right now. So that's a very similar thing to, I've lived in La La Land where war isn't a thing to all of a sudden I'm in it. And that's that, right? So that's that, that's that, that's the actual trauma. The actual trauma is that world is fake. This is the real world and now you're not So, so the answer is not to coddle. The answer is get, teach people to be stronger. You know what I mean? So you don't want to like take away. It's just like I was saying about, about moral development earlier. You don't learn to handle moral situations, morally ambiguous situations, except by handling morally ambiguous situations. And when you're raising your children, for example, you put them in those situations and then you coach them through them. And then they get good reps of doing the right thing and pretty soon they build habits. You know, when that gets when that gets into their, you know, when, it, when, those, when those synaptic connections are so well developed to, to do the right thing, they'll do the right thing. But it didn't get there overnight. It got there by repetitions, just like in cycle of learning. Matt? Sir? So, so what you were just describing and what I've written in my notes here is what we do every day. Exactly. Right, so it, it's important that we explain it. And it's not always, Intuitive to us, and maybe even not always intuitive to us as we're doing it. And I've, I've heard John McMahon you know, sit back there a number of times today. We're trying to take transition from human response to trained response when it comes to the aquatic environment. Right? The human response, if they've never been in the water, is, is panic, it's flapping arms, kicking legs, vertical, you go to the bottom, you're out to die. The trained response is taking, taking out that cognition, how to learn something. Uh, a squeeze kick, horizontal, get to a position of safety, survive, right? So it's kind of the survival mode that you, you showed with the wolves there. And sometimes I think it's appropriate for us to take that time in class and describe why it is we're, we are teaching boxing. We're not teaching boxing so that you're gonna go out and, and be the golden gloves. We're teaching boxing so that if you, metaphorically, or really in boxing, get punched in the face, now you can think through the problem take that human response of, ah, to a trained response of, oh, okay, now I have some tools at my disposal.
disposable, and I can solve this problem, work my way out of this problem, and, and ultimately in our business, obviously, you'll be not just yourself through that problem, but others. And so, I, you know, this is incredibly interesting. What I had a couple of comments, though. One, Matt, you could go on Survivor. You know, you want to <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>